that's your tool. Okay. Page. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, hi. Good to see you. And did you speak well? Yes, excellent. Yeah, okay, we can start. So welcome to the North to the days of uh, quantum computing. So it's a meeting that is organized every year by the CNRS, by a work group of the CNRS, the IT by the CNRS. And the local organizer, organizers are uh, Pierre Lamasson, Frédéric Olvec, and Henri de Boutre. Well, if you have any trouble, ask them. And uh, so I wish you uh, good days and uh, happy as coming. And uh, I think uh, uh, the chairman will be uh, Pierre Alain for this uh, afternoon. Okay, so thank you uh, for, for coming, as, as Alain said. Um, uh, we have a special session in the afternoon about uh, contextuality, programs and entanglement. And uh, the first talk is an invited talk by Madame Abichit. Thank you. So, First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. I'll start with some formal points and we'll dwell on applications and implementations later on. An important feature of quantum systems in general and in particular with respect to the construction of all known procedures and protocols of contextual sets is the orthogonality, mutual orthogonalities of vectors or vertices. And you simply cannot attack such a problem head-on because the brute force is not feasible even with the strongest supercomputers because you've got nonlinear equations for the orthogonalities and such problems are of the exponential complexity. So some 20 years ago I came to an idea to establish a correspondence between vectors and vertices of hypergraphs and between orthogonalities and edges on which such vertices sit. It turns out to be of statistically polynomial complexity, therefore feasible. A hypergraph is in general a pair VE, where V is a set of elements called vertices, simply like that. And E is a set of non-empty subsets of itself called edges. So that's interesting because edge is a set of vertices related to each other. In our case, orthogonality, but it can be any other property that's up to the researchers to find. Each vertex is denoted by one of the ASCII characters with the exception of zero. And the sign plus has a special role to enable repeating such a string in case we have got many vertices. So when we exhaust all ASCII characters I mentioned, then we continue with the same ASCII characters preceded by sign plus, then two pluses and so on, ad infinitum, because our programs have no limitations on the number of vertices. It's proper to introduce a particular kind of hypergraphs, the so-called mckay mcgill pavicic hypergraph kind, which is actually the most general hypergraph with the exception of the third point here, which tells us that two or more intersections are allowed at the vertices of each pair of edges, provided that the number of vertices on edges is greater than or equal to four. That's actually the content of this third point. So we can split the hypergraphs from the vectors we started with and come to the vectors later on. And we did so at the beginning, some 15 years ago, by just generating hypergraphs in general without any content, without vectors, that means without coordinatization, and without any property of, for example, contextuality or non-contextuality, just bare hypergraphs. We generated successfully the so-called Perez class of such hypergraphs in this way and hit the computational barrier with systems with 24 vertices and 24 edges. 
uh, how we then found the particular known sets by filtering all those obtained general hypergraphs so as to become first MMP ages and then to assign to them vectors and get Cohen-Specker vectors out of them. So MMP age can be endowed with the property of contextuality versus non-contextuality and here we have got a general definition that n-dimensional MMPH, non-binary, contextual set with the number of dimensions being equal or greater than three, is a hypergraph whose each edge contains at least two and at most n vertices to which it is impossible to sign one and zero in such a way that no two vertices within any of its edges are both assigned the value one and in any of its edges not all of the vertices are assigned the value zero. These two conditions are important. So here I visualize them where the vertices are shown as vectors, although we still don't speak about vectors for, for easier visualization. That's the first condition and that's the second condition here. This one corresponds to these two options and this one corresponds to this. If it's possible to satisfy these two conditions, then we speak about the MMPH binary set, that means non-contextual sure. set. And then when we come to coordinatization, we should have vertices sitting in three or four whatever dimensional space. That means that although we can consider less than n vertices sitting on an edge for a particular purpose, experiment and so on. In general, we have to assure that we can have coordinatizations for all of them. And so when we have got some hypergraphs with truncated edges, then we have first to fill such a hypergraph, that means add all the vertices that are missing there and find coordinatization for all of them and then we can go back to our truncated hypergraphs. So in order to make experiments, to evaluate, to distinguish between contextual and non-contextual property of a particular set, we introduce two indices, quantum hypergraph index, which is simply sum of probabilities of getting detector clicks for all considered vertices. And the classical hypergraph index is a maximal number of ones assigned to vertices so as to satisfy the two conditions from the previous slide. That means first and the second condition. Here we have got examples of hypergraphs which have real vectors that we can assign to a full number of vertices. So here you imagine one vertex here and another here and then you have to find the coordinatization and you can see that for these when you calculate that with special algorithms that would exhaust all possible assignments you can see that neither this nor that loop can have a solution so it simply cannot have a consistent representation i mean there are no vectors that would make this loop feasible and you see why we need all the vertices, because if we don't take coordinatization into account, then these two vertices together with its edge would collapse into a two-dimensional space, and this vertex would be required to be simultaneously a three-dimensional and a two-dimensional, so that's inconsistent. The first feasible loop is a pentagon. We can then see a very interesting feature. Coordinatization is possible, and then if we look at only those vertices that share two edges, we have got a contextual pentagon. If we add any other vertex, then we have got a non-contextual pentagon. So that's going to be important later on. Another problem is that when we look at the coordinatization we can obtain, when we look at the original Cohen-Specker set, which is 192 vertices 118 edges set we see that the number of vector components is 29 and the vectors themselves are very complicated and there is no way that any cluster in the world would find it by an automated search so we obtain the coordinatization directly for the original construction but we somehow have to manage this problem later on so first the 
main effort was directed towards qubits and the combinations and tensor products of qubit spaces, primarily because of the quantum computation application. So we had solved many of the even dimensional spaces, which contain 4, 8, 16, 32 qubits. Various groups did that in the past by looking at the sources of the so-called master sets that are big sets from which smaller sets can be generated via symmetries, geometry, Pauli operators, polytopes, Witting polytopes, Lie algebras, qubit states, in particular Michel Planat's qubit state master sets for the 16 and 32 dimensions. So last year we tried to solve this problem of generating new sets in order to enable a deeper insight into the whole problem. And then Norman McGill, a co-worker of mine, came to an ingenious idea of just combining the simplest possible vector components into an algorithm which would assign these vector components as vectors in combinations in whichever dimensions to the vertices and in that way automatically obtain both hypergraphs and decoordinatization. And we see the result. The masters include automatically all the previous masters and generate many new small sets. And the beauty of that is that we can pick up whatever combinations of elementary components plus one minus one plus i minus i or we can add two and we can use three and only minus one and we always get different masters sometimes a combination of contextual and non-contextual ones for example this one is shown here because 636 vertices and 1657 edges split into all these samples uh, here you have got a denser distribution only because we did a lot of generations previously with other methods so we had the sets we knew we should obtain. But in general, when you apply such algorithms, curiously, they first give big critical sets and then later on smaller ones. Here is an example of a subset and you see from Cabello 18.9 set on, we have all known sets obtained in that. So when we solved the generation of the majority of such qubit sets, we switch to the problem of treating qubit sets and they have got a particular feature which required new algorithms and that is because of that pentagon loops and because of three dimensions we have got a lot of vertices shown here in grey that sit on only one edge. Historically the authors of the known four Qtrit contextual sets in three dimensions, then discarded these gray vertices and called their sets 33 set, 31 set, 33 and 117 for the original Cohen Specker. And somehow people considered that they were all critical. Well, the critical means if we delete any of the edges, then a set would stop being contextual and would stop being non-binary. However, that's simply not the truth because none of these sets 33, 31, 33 and 117 Cohen-Specker is critical. That means we can simply use them to generate all small sets in three dimensions. In order to see how we can do that, we'll first look at that example of U and O's 1316 set. That means we'll consider a truncated set and its properties. They came with such a set and they claimed that such a truncated set is a subgraph or subset of the Perez's set. That's not correct because it is not a subset of either 3340 or 5740. But if we fill this set uh, in order to obtain such a set where we take into account all the vertices that can be put in all edges in three dimensions, then this is a subset of the 5740 Perez set. So how do they 
consider only 13 and not 25 sets. First of all, they did not prove the cohen specker theorem, as I have shown in this paper. But they established a completely new version of looking and searching for contextuality among the quantum sets by paying attention only to particular vertices and not to the others. In particular, they picked the 13 vertices out of 25 to construct an expression of vector vertices state defined operators that eventually reduce to a multiple of a unit operator, which means it allows for the mean value to be compared with the expression obtained directly from corresponding classical set of observables. And they found a particular inequality will discuss later on. Also, there are two other operator-based inequalities and consideration of only particular vertices within sets by these two groups. They made use of projectors whose expressions are reduced to a multiple of a unit operator. So, non-criticality of the known sets lead us to a new kind of contextualities and we can establish the correspondence between Cohen-Specker reasoning and this hypergraph contextuality reasoning via MMP ages so as to take only those vertices that share two or more edges. And then when we take those vertices and edges within sets and the corresponding sets as our master set, we can generate all smaller subsets out of that. And we show them here. We see the distributions of the smaller sets we obtained from the four known three-dimensional sets. And here we have got some samples of it. And also here we can see how important is the graphical representation because the fact that we didn't describe any ASCII character to this figure doesn't matter because we can assign ASCII characters in whatever order we want, for example, one, two, three, four, and so on, as you can see here. And for example, this set we can combine into Perez's set even when none of this character is shown here. And all what's important for computer handling of such sets are ASCII strings of vertices organized within edges in this way. So we can go to and from, we can easily represent this string as a figure and the other way around. So let me go back to U and O. Here is the expression they used to get a result which can be compared with the classical equivalent result, meaning that L has got two eigenvalues, minus one and plus one, which we can then ascribe to corresponding classical observables. And then the expression equivalent to this one gives us a maximum of eight minus or plus ones combined together. That gives us the non-contextual U or inequality, which shows that a set 1316 is a contextual set. And then we simply put that in the computer, more precisely into Mathematica, and that's why we tested only 50 sets. It's half manual jump. And we also calculated the same expression for some 50, 50 sets, and we didn't find any other set which would allow the satisfaction of this inequality. But our inequality comes as a rescue here. So first to see how we can carry out experiments and implementations. When we have got triples, meaning all three vertices on an edge, then the assigning of probabilities to each vertex is a standard one, one third in three-dimensional case. When we consider only doublets and doublet gates, we have to calibrate data and in effect allow for longer run of inputs for doublets than for triplets in ratios three to one. When a vertex shares a mixture of a triplet and doublet edges, the probability of detections is in between one third and one half. And also we can look at uncalibrated detections in which we just take equal distribution of input particles and then look whether we have got a non-contextual inequality satisfied or not. So our method then gives calibrated non-contextual inequality for 1411. That's 
this set and we see that we have got quantum hypergraph index 5.53 bigger than classical one but uncalibrated quantum index is not bigger than 5 and when we look at for example U OS 1316 we have got the calibrated inequality with a bigger difference than they obtained originally. Then we look at the 1310 here and we see that we have got such a situation. Then when we look at this thing here, so it's a very interesting beast with two pentagons incorporated. It's interesting that if we remove this one or this one or this one, two of them together, then we still have a critical contextual set. But if we remove all three of them, the set stops being critical and we can then obtain smaller sets but then it appears that there are no smaller critical sets other than pentagons. So the structure is very different from the Cohen Specker sets because when we remove one of the edges from a critical Cohen Specker set then it stops being critical and stops being contextual and when we remove further edges, it never again becomes contextual or critical. It is not so with the hypergraph contextual sets, because we can obtain smaller and smaller sets by removing edges from bigger ones. So recently it has been revealed that contextual sets can play rather important and crucial role in quantum computation. And when we look into the structure, we see that this Hypergraph is exactly of our type, that means of the hypergraph contextual type that we dealt with. And it also allows to obtain smaller sets with the same property, so it's very promising in a further elaboration of such sets. So that would be all, folks. binary at the beginning, what does it refer to? It means, yeah, so when I say binary, non-binary, it means that we can assume predetermined values for non-contextual sets. So we can assume that these two conditions hold for such a set. That means two conditions for binary? Yes. So two conditions for binary is that we can assign value 1 and 0 without a contradiction. And for contextual set, by definition, it's impossible to sign 1 and 0 to the vertices so as to satisfy these two conditions. That explains our hypergraph indices, because here we have got a maximal number of ones assigned to vertices. So when we have got a binary system, then we can assign without a contradiction ones and zeros to vertices within such a system. But when we have got contextual non-binary system, then we are not able to do that. But we are able to do that with particular vertices in a number of edges. When we have got the maximal ones we can assign to various vertices, then it defines our hypergraph index and our inequality. But in the second, it can be strictly smaller? Can it be strictly smaller? Yes, yes. I found a lot of uh, sets that have got exactly the same number. Because then you have got some of probabilities being equal to the number of the ones you can assign. For example, you can have a sum of probabilities being equal to 4, and then the sum of ones that you can assign also 4. I mean, it comes from the structure of a particular set you treat, and in this paper you have got some examples. So when, when you distinguish a contextual hypergraph and non-contextual, it's by checking this definition on, the, on your computer program? or. Yes, on a computer program, which can give us automatically for any size of the set the answer. Like uh, these two points. Yeah, yeah, it, it just automatically has an output of the kind. So it says, yes, it is contextual. Yes, it has got so many ones maximally assigned minimum. Also, it's possible to find. When, when you identify a, a contextual paragraph, is it easy to find the set of vector associated to it? to build a set of vectors explicitly from the graph? 
we have got two approaches. We can build hypergraphs without any reference to any vector, but in order to build bigger sets, we have to make use of our algorithms, which gives us sets together with the coordinatization from the set of small components of vectors. I mean, we can use any set of vector components, but then is the question where we would hit the barrier of the reduction of the obtained master set from such a set. For example, we can put all these 29 components for the original Cohen-Specker set into computer and we will get a master set, which is huge. But then we tried for months on a supercomputer to get any set out of that and it, it, it simply wasn't feasible. It's not clear to us whether we have got perhaps only one smaller set and that's original Kaya sets or they are just rare and you can't find them so easily. Could you recall how you define the master set? From yeah, master set is a set which is obtained in some of the reviewed procedures. So for even dimensional spaces we find qubit states of Lie algebra states of regular polytope or Whitting polytope up and so on and these sets that we find are not critical and these all refer to Cohen-Specker sets so they have got full number of vertices on their edges and from them we can reduce the number of edges simply deleting edges and obtain many smaller contextual critical sets and here we have got a systemic method of just using vector components to get master set by an algorithm it means it always gives us some big set which is contextual but which is not critical and that means we can use them by deleting the edges to obtain smaller critical ones not only critical ones but also other smaller ones critical ones are important for an experiment because we don't misuse the resources because the additional edge which doesn't give us anything new is not worth implementing it's three dimension yeah yeah what is the smallest uh, critical uh, set that's a good question, <laughs> because when we look at this distribution, it all depends on how we define subgraphs. And these and these sets are not subgraphs in the ordinary sense of the word. It means we have to, with another set of algorithms, remove some of the vertices or some of the edges to obtain smaller sets. And in this paper, I called such subgraphs, quasi subgraphs or pseudo subgraphs. I've got a line over a subgraph because it's not a real subgraph, but it's a legitimate set. It's a contextual set with the coordinatization and everything else satisfied. And when we look at a general three dimensional set, we see that we can add or remove those vertices that share only one edge. And so we can do that with these sets as well. But we'll have a different algorithm to produce both kinds of subgraphs. So that's another source of additional examples of contextual sets that are not covered by a head-on approach in the subgraph sense. Yes, for, I have a question because for uh, a big progress was performed in four dimension when uh, the so-called Nermin square, the three by three grid, was introduced. Because in that case, it was, in terms of operators, they got the smallest proof that we could get with mm. this 3 by 3 grid in terms of operators, and at the level of the corresponding eigenvector, it was needed 18 uh, rays, 18 vectors, and, and 9, nine uh, edges. It was more, more or less because it, it is simple, and of, of course one could get also other proofs with larger critical sets. But, and, and the question is, what about three dimensions? What are the, the basic, the basic objects? No, so in three dimensions, the basic object is five five. So you cannot have smaller than the pentagon. Question: uh, Contextuality is also a matter of definition, as you uh, of uh, And I thought we had the idea of a state-independent proof contextuality, more or less equivalent to the quotient speaker set you mm -hmm. are using and also state-dependent proofs related to the Pentagon. That's a Pentagon which allows state-independent proof. 
state independent? Yeah, yeah, it's state independent. Because we have got a different kind of inequalities which confirm the contextuality than in the Smolovsky or whatever its name. Yeah, okay. So it's a new kind of non-contextual inequalities with respect to already present ones. For example, these authors and then you and all and the regional pentagram inequalities are all different. I should stress that the inequalities I use are also possible to implement with cohen specker sets. Because for every cohen specker set, our programs just give the maximum amount of ones that we can ascribe to any cohen specker set. And then we can calculate the quantum hypergraph index by just multiplying the number of vertices with one third and compare them. Thank you.